The Google Hacking CTF 2019 qualifier had a hardware category, and there's one challenge that caught my eye, Mindtest, which is based on the game engine with the same name, Mindtest. An open source Minecraft clone. I thought that sounds like fun. I have stumbled upon this weird Mindtest map. Can you make sense out of it? Mindtest plus Mesicons required. Mindtest is the main open source voxel game engine and Mesicons is a mod which adds advanced digital circuitry like logic gates and programmable blocks. Because this challenge is in the hardware category, it totally makes sense that this is about digital circuitry and logic gates. Setting the game up is super simple, just follow the instructions. When we download the challenge files, we can find a folder called real, which contains various files like a map SQLite, a world MT, and other stuff. So how can we load this into the game? First, I was looking through the folders of the files to see if something looks similar to know where to place it. I copied it into the mods folders and some others, but nothing seemed to work. Then I had the idea to create a new world test game in my test and looked at the logs. This showed me that there is now a folder called world, which seems like a good place. The challenge file is probably a world. So copy it over and restart the game and there it is. We can load into the game. Awesome spawn, we just fall down. But like with Minecraft, I assumed there must be features in creative mode to fly and teleport around. And in the key bindings, I was able to find shortcuts for flying, no clip and even faster movement. And from the Mindtest wiki, I learned about the console and the teleport command. Awesome, now we can teleport back to the start and use flying. This is a recording from during the CTF. This was literally the first time I saw it. I just kept flying up and was a bit shocked. I immediately made a screenshot and sent it to my teammates. This is one of their reactions. Was? The circuit den du reversen musst. Fuck. <laughs> So I just kept flying around a bit, trying to see how big the circuit is and what exactly the challenge is. After flying for a minute or so, I found the first logic gate and a few minutes later, I reached the end. Here you can see the gates better. This should be an AND gate. This should be an OR gate and this is an inverter. And here's the final output. So the challenge goal is clear. If you have watched my Pwn Adventure series, you can find the link up there, then you know already the Blocky's Revenge Challenge. It's basically the same. We have levers as inputs and at the end we have a single output. We just have to find the correct input that leads to a one at the output. So mind test is basically Blocky's Revenge Revenge. But there's one difference. In Pwn Adventure, the circuit was fairly small and could be reversed by hand in a matter of a few hours, as have teams done during the original Pwn Adventure CTF. However, this mind test challenge is insane. No chance to do this by hand. But this also makes the challenge straightforward and we basically know exactly what we have to do. First, we have to somehow extract the circuit, for example, from the world map files. And then we have to solve it, for example, with a SAT solver like Z3. But just because the challenge direction is clear, doesn't mean the path is without obstacles. So task one, passing the world file. Because this is open source, we should find plenty of resources about this. For example, I was sure people made map generators, like people would make Minecraft maps. To draw a map, you have to somehow pass the world file. So I was basically Googling for a bit for mapping projects, details about parsing, and eventually we found the official Mindtest world format documentation. And it seemed easy. There's a map SQLite file. Mindtest maps consist of map blocks, chunks of 16 by 16 by 16 nodes. Map SQLite is an SQLite 3 database containing a single table called blocks. It looks like this. So this table simply contains position as a single integer and the data binary blob. The documentation also gives us example code on how to turn XYZ coordinates into the single integer position and vice versa. And then we have the binary blob, which is described in the map block serialization format. I figured somebody must have already written a parser for this to extract the map, so I spent quite some time looking for various GitHub projects and scripts that deal with this file. 
and I found various things that have helped me to write my code. But nothing really worked for me right away, mostly because we have non-standard blocks from the Mesicons mod, but eventually I got some first script parsing the data running. I thought it would be a good idea to visualize the map parsing in order to verify that it works. So I used Pillow, the Python image library, to draw pixels for the blocks I'm parsing. Here it is. I did this based on some metadata information, basically some strings in each binary block that told me that there was Mesicons related stuff in there. Because Mesicons is the mod that implements the logic gates, I figured if I color every block that contains Mesicon stuff, I should get an image of the whole circuit. I still wouldn't know what component it is, like a connection or a gate, but it should get a shadow image of the circuit. Good enough for a first test. Doesn't this look already awesome? You can really see the circuit emerging. I could even see that some blocks contain gates, so I even played with different coloring and I thought I solved it soon. But at some point I noticed some weird things. It bothered me. And that was, shouldn't be the input levers be in its own row? Like they start here and then the blocks actually start here. But when I draw it, then the first layer here is just one long connected line. This really blocked me for a bit, pun intended. And I wonder if you realize my mistake. The crucial line in the documentation is, mind test maps consist of map blocks chunks of 16 by 16 by 16 nodes. Ah, uh, crap. A block is a chunk and a node is an actual block. What I thought I was parsing were single blocks, but in fact I was dealing with 16 by 16 chunks. So inside these chunks I have 16 by 16 blocks to deal with. So once I realized that, I had to extend my parser and once I figured out how the format exactly works, I was able to draw each individual block. Here you can see my first attempt. Now the map is also way larger and you can see the individual input level blocks. This has cost me hours, but in the end it looks really cool. I didn't fully have to render it because I knew my parsing was working, so I could move on to solving it now. But if you are curious, I rendered the whole circuit and put it up on liveoverflow.com. So head over to the liveoverflow.com blog if you want to look at it. But how do we solve this huge combinational logic circuit? First of all, I decided to store the parse data in a different format, so I don't have to reparse the SQLite file with all the chunks I'm not even interested in every time when I want to test my script. That would be too slow. So I created a 2D grid array or matrix and all this and just used a single character to indicate what block or node, as we should call it, is. Here's the large if case that checks the type. So for a simple line, I used a pipe or a dash. For a crossover, I used a plus. For a corner, I used one of these characters and also here are some letters for gates and or XOR and not. The Pygame stuff around here is just the pixel drawing code and after I have created this 2D array, I save it to a file, grid.py. Then I created a new script called trace.py and can simply import the grid without doing the SQLite parsing again. And now we come to the actual interesting part. How do we solve this? As mentioned in the beginning, we need some kind of SAT solver that can solve the Boolean circuit equation for us. I like to use SAT3 for that. I've also used SAT3 in a previous video, I linked it in the corner. So here basically it starts. I created the function trace, which takes a coordinate and a direction. This is the coordinate of the final output. So this is the end of the circuit. And we are tracing to the left. In the way I've oriented the grid, the circuit goes to the left. This is the whole function. It's a recursive function that basically walks the whole circuit starting at the output. So let's see how that works. We start here with the direction D to the left. Now we have a while true that gets the character from the grid and it will be a dash. So dash to the left means we decrement the coordinate on the X axis. We move to the left. And so we keep doing that until we reach this gate. And now this character C is an AND gate. First we check if we have visited this gate before. This is just to optimize the algorithm. We don't need to redo the magic, we just return the visited value in such a case. But what is the magic that we do? And this is here. So if we have not visited, we set visited to this. 
We call simplify. Simplify is a function by z3 to simplify an equation. I call this every function just to let c3 simplify the equation we currently have in every step. Not sure if really needed, but so we return here a Boolean function. And the Boolean function we create here is an AND. Obviously, we have an AND gate. And the inputs to that AND gate are, of course, the two paths going up and down. So the two input parameters to this AND gate have to be traced too. We trace now the path down and we trace the path up. It calls recursively the trace function. So this can only return once we finish these trace calls. And these trace calls keep walking the circuit in the same way and they keep calling trace on each new gate. And you can see it slowly walks down the whole circuit recursively. And then at some point we reach the end. At some point a trace function will find a lever and then it will return a Boolean variable. This is a Z3 Boolean variable with the name based on the lever's coordinates. And so now the whole circuit collapses. This returns a bool variable, which means the trace function that called this trace function can, for example, finally return the end, an end of Boolean level one and Boolean level two, for example. Now this created a Boolean function about these two Booleans and now they can return to the next layer of the trace function which then of course pass that return to its new gate, for example an OR. And so you can see how that parses out the whole circuit. At some point the trace returns the whole circuit as a Boolean formula. Here it is. This is the whole circuit printed. The output depends on an AND which itself has an input coming from a NOT and that NOT has an input from an AND and so forth. And several layers deep we reach at some point our Boolean variables. Those are the levers. And now we simply ask the three. We want this whole trace to be true. We want the output to be true. Please solve this. That's it. Z3 will now do its solving magic and return exactly the value of the Boolean variables that make the output true. It just takes a few seconds. There it is. Those are the solved states of the levers. Sort them by number and here is the binary input. That is the flag. We can submit it and get the points. Nice. As you can see, pretty straightforward challenge. It's more of a programming challenge because the path is pretty clear. It's not really security, but it's really fun and learn a lot about parsing custom file or data formats and generally practices the craft of using technology. However, you need to know about something like Z3. But that's a typical CTF tool that you know about if you read write-ups. I mean, even if you just watch my videos, you would have known about it from that video I mentioned earlier. However, if you happen to be an electrical engineer, you might even know other tools to solve this. For example, Keck solved it using a Verilog netlist optimizer or solver. I don't really know how it works. Uh, Verilog is a language you can use to design hardware and program FPGAs. We have also used that before in uh, the video I link up there. And the design suites you use for hardware design also come with tools to optimize and solve circuits like this. And so he transformed the data into a netlist usable by such a tool and let it solve it. Super clever usage of what is a normal tool for hardware developers. Which also shows you that this challenge is a real world practical use of these kind of tools. This is not super esoteric or unrealistic. It's gamified with a Minecraft clone, but this challenge taught you a bit about the hardware world.